welcome to the Work Joy Jam podcast. In this episode, I am joined by Cornelia Lucy and Cornelia and I met on a course a few years ago and we've been in touch ever since. And Cornelia is a positive psychologist and she works in the field of leadership and development. And I thought it'd be really interesting to take a question here around positive psychology and around leadership and how we can link that to joy and to have a really great conversation about what are some of the features we find in leaders who are doing a really great job what are some of those characteristics what are they taking with them how are they thinking how are they acting what are they doing and we all know how critical great leadership is in organizations but it also isn't necessarily an easy thing to do. Anyone who is in a leadership position right now, be that through actual title or the role that you perform within your role, it is a tough gig leading people. And I think it's really interesting to take the point from positive psychology about what are the things here that are those features and how might we spend some time thinking about them and developing them. So I really hope you enjoy this conversation between myself and Cornelia. Hello and welcome to the Work Joy Jam. On this episode, I am joined by the fabulous Cornelia Lucy. And Cornelia and I have known us each other for a little while. And I'm really excited to talk to her about her perspective on Work Joy. And I think you're all going to love it too. So rather than me introduce you, Cornelia, can I get you to introduce yourself and tell us kind of your backstory and how you got to where you are today? Yes, definitely. Uh, Beth, thanks so much for having me on today. Uh, Excited to be with you. Um, So as you know, Beth, a bit about me, my background. I am a business owner. I'm a psychologist. I'm a leadership consultant and I'm a coach. So I'm this uh, kind of melee or mix of different hats that I wear in the work that I do today. Um, And I guess I suppose a little bit of backstory about how I got to where I am now and what I'm doing now. I always start, I think, by talking to people about my family background, which has been a massive uh, influence on me. Um, You'll probably gasp when I tell you this. I don't think I've told you this before, Beth, but I am uh, one of 37 first cousins just on my mum's side alone. So I come from this absolutely huge family. And then my dad has absolutely um, loads of aunts, uncles and cousins as well. So both my parents are Irish um, and they immigrated to London back in the 70s um, and I grew up in a you know the real kind of heart of East End of London uh, with this massive Irish family um, traveling back and forth between England and Ireland and then growing up in the East End surrounded by people from all over the world um, so really like incredible opportunity to grow up in that environment um, just surrounded by people who are like really single-minded about making better lives for themselves loads of imagination creativity and just really got me fascinated in culture and people and you know, just having so many kind of relatives, cousins, family members, watching everyone kind of grow and age in their own way and develop in their own way, just always been really fascinating to to me. And which is probably why my first career, I actually was a successful newspaper journalist. um, And I was really interested in interviewing people, doing what you're doing today. Um, Worked for a newspaper agency in Ireland, um, got to interview really fascinating people like the late Amy Winehouse, um, talk with prime ministers um, from all over the world, travel with the Irish prime minister to, to China and do sorts of, all sorts of interesting um, experiences as a journalist. And in that uh, field, I eventually got appointed as an education correspondent. And so I was going in and out of schools, universities, working with politicians who specialise in education and became really interested in how we learn and how we develop even further. And I kind of had a bit of a, a curveball when I decided, actually, do you know what? I'm going to go and teach in a school. I want to know what that looks like. And I decided to um, do something called the Leadership uh, Development Programme Teach First. And I worked in one of England's most struggling schools. 
and alongside working in one of England's most struggling schools in fact Ofsted described it as one of the worst schools in the country which is always really helpful um, <laughs> if you're an organisation trying to trying to, to grow get better and um, was also doing a lot of leadership development training myself and went into kind of middle leadership in schools and just really like this ongoing fascination for like people's stories how people learn how people develop and working with a really like big array of, of different types of leaders um, and I suppose I got interested in mechanism processes and then I went and trained as a management consultant um, and had a focus on leadership development and worked with two kind of uh, one international education charity one UK based education charity and got to kind of travel all around the world and um, lived, lived in the Middle East for a while um, went to South America, did lots of interesting projects. And all through, I guess, these different experiences became really interested in the theory and the practice and the application and just the real world of how leaders behaved and developed and how they brought the best out of others. And then also, I guess I was noticing how people were not always bringing the best out of others. Um, and the things that I noticed in all the different array of workplaces um, that I was working in was the fact that well-being, resilience, how well people were able to bring themselves to work and do a really good job and enjoy the work they were doing was so hugely affected by the leaders um, around them um, and by the way that people were either supported through a kind of pro-social environment or the way people were actually really hindered um, in an environment that wasn't bringing the best out of others. So I guess I had all of this kind of uh, anecdotal evidence and then leadership theory and understanding around you know what what we thought in leadership brought the best out of people I'd done a, a master's in leadership and um, at uh, UCL in London and I felt that actually I needed to dig a bit deeper because it wasn't just I guess the, the theories and the learning the practice but I wanted to understand a little bit more about what's going on in this kind of computer in our head like what was going on in people's brains and um, for them to behave the ways that they were behaving kind of positively or not so positively and also what do we know about human behaviour in terms of what brought the best out of individuals and what brought the best out of teams and organisations? So about five years ago now, I trained as a psychologist to kind of add that um, string to my bow. Um, and it's been really incredible five years bringing together what I know from leadership development and from psychology, um, particularly looking at things like positive psychology. functioning in individuals like what's the science behind that what do we know where's the evidence base and I apply that you know in my work now um, I specifically do a lot of work with leaders and teams and organizations to develop you know individuals and their performance their leadership performance but also teams and also just thinking about the organization as a whole and it's a really lovely blend of doing work that you know involves research so I do a lot of research I'm writing a book at the moment to try and draw some of that research together and a lot of practice then a lot of development work and it's just a real it's a real work joy to do what I do because I really see you know what are the ingredients that help leaders their teams their communities to alight and how do we kind of embed those in the way that we work and develop those and the clients I work with have just really, I guess, thrown themselves into that, wanted to explore that. And, you know, if we really want a world that's, you know, sustainable, equitable, inspiring for everybody, then I really think, you know, how we develop more positive leadership practices for ourselves and for others and, and the organisations that we work with is just going to be really, really critical. Um, and I think, you know, the pandemic and experiences that we've had over the last year or so have kind of really reinforced that. For me and um you know i know our podcast today is, is about work joy and i really get a huge amount of work joy in seeing that happen and seeing people alight and um in seeing i guess the evidence making a real difference in workplaces so i guess that's a whistle stop tour of my of my background um, and my story best so feel free to kind of pick away and ask me any questions I've got so many questions to ask you. Now. Um, <laughs> I, I've been writing them down and highlighting them and, and sharing them. So I'm like, thank you so much for sharing your story. And I love the combination of both kind of the life story and the work story. Because for me, when we talk about work joy, work is not separate from life. It is mm. part of life. And 
yeah. I think the more we think about them as blended together, the more we'll mm. be able to get more joy from work and more joy from life and be able to have that more successful blend and people often talk to me about work-life balance and they talk to me and I'm like "Mm, I'm not sure balance is actually really the way that we want to go because Mm -hmm. sometimes in life work is going to take some priorities sometimes life is going to take some priorities we're only saving Mm -hmm. for balance we might get actually really out of sync with what we need Mm -hmm. but if we talk about kind of blending those things together and understanding and having really good boundaries and all that stuff then we can make that stuff happen but that is a whole nother conversation and I I have so many questions for you so the first one I'm going to say is um one of 37 first cousins on one side of your family um (laughs) right I have six cousins in my entire family (laughs) both sides and I struggle to keep up with them so 37 that is a big big family I love that and I'm loving kind of how you grew up and the big word I wrote down with talking about your whole career and what you've done in your life I wrote down this in big bold letters and then highlighted it I find like you have a real sense of curiosity around Mm. things and Mm. maybe that did spark from having so many people in your life Mm. and being surrounded by such interesting people but Mm. almost like you find something and then you're like oh I want to dig a bit deeper I want to find out more I want to study that I want to understand it more Mm. is that does that sound like I've kind of nailed that there yeah definitely I think you know I feel really blessed to have had the you know the range of family and the range of upbringing that I've had um and it's I think the it, it's almost been like a virtuous cycle in a sense that I've been exposed to so many different pay, people, places, environments um, throughout my life, um, which is also then fed into that curiosity. So I think it's a kind of it's a virtuous circle. And and also just I suppose it's, you know, also, as you can imagine, we're such a huge family. We have incredible um positive emotive experiences we have a lot of joy in our in our family we also have a lot of tragedy in our family as well Mm. so you know you can't avoid that it's it's a part of life so I've seen I guess the 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 light and dark side of of life um in a personal level in family relationships situations and I think I've always been open to understanding that and being empathetic and then compassionate about that in the work environment and just also really recognizing the essential need to as you just said there Beth you know um be aware of those things in that they, that they, they don't transcend or co- compartmentalize into work and personal life um they go that they're much bigger they do transcend um and we need to, you know, as leaders working in organisations to really bring the best out of ourselves and others, we've got to really own that, be honest about that and and put that forward. And, you know, the, all of the research that I've done has shown that in being curious about that for ourselves, for others um, and being open about that is, is actually a win-win situation for, for leaders and for, um, for everyone else around a leader in a team in an organisation, because, that curiosity that care that that um compassion and understanding that we're all living lives and these lives are you know melting pots of different experiences will actually help us do our best work and to really enjoy the work um, that we're doing if we're really honest and open about those things and authentic about those things it's really interesting there because uh, you're talking about like joy and tragedy and understanding the melting pot of life there. I love that as a description is one of the things that I always talk about in work joy is it is definitely not about being happy 24 seven, ignoring mm. the stuff that isn't right. Mm. And it's not about, it's about actually understanding that there will be light and dark. It's about understanding that you can do more to build some light, but also that there's going to be stuff that happens both in work and life. There will be tragedy. There will be sadness. There will be damn right frustrating stuff that it just annoys you. There will be all of those things. Mm, yeah. But actually, how do we how do we capture and cultivate and focus on some of the more joyful things to help us through some of those situations, to help us mm. work with other people? So I, I really love what you're talking about there. So yeah. my next question. Can, can I jump is, in on yeah, that? Yeah, of course you can. Yeah, because, <laughs> because, yeah, it's like, how can we capture, you know, some of the joy, the, the positive emotion, uh, the experience into that? And I, I think the negative emotions the dark emotions the more you know the the harder things we experience it can actually you know really leaning into those experiencing those accepting those can make a whole lot of really good stuff happen in our brains um and you know I know that you'll totally agree with this I think 
and people have been kind of banding and talking about you know toxic positivity and just thinking purely positively about things and we you know we do know from the research that actually the the, the darker experiences the more challenging moments those gritty times and experiences can be like really pivotal learning moments if we kind of lean into them and explore them and just again kind of going back to that curiosity point earlier on just be interested in those and you know whether it's a kind of tension in a relationship at work or a tension in a relationship at home just you know what what is going on here rather than you've done this or he's done that or she's done this actually what is it that I'm bringing into this conversation? What is the other person bringing into the conversation? And what, what's going on here? How do we need to, to do this in a way that, that works for both of us? So, yeah, um, really uh, interesting reflection. And I think I think that's it. I, we don't, I don't want to get into the zone of toxic positivity because it's not the right place to be. And it is about finding some balance there. And, uh, you know, that idea that often these moments, whether it's like, utter sadness or tragedy or frustration that mm-hmm. it's telling you something mm-hmm. it's telling you that maybe totally. you're ready to move on it might be telling yeah. you that you need to have a conversation with your partner it's telling you that you might be ready to actually dig a bit deeper into some of the emotions and understand where they come from so mm-hmm. it's about taking it understanding it and then mm-hmm. working with it isn't it it's not about ignoring Definitely. it or brushing over it because Definitely that's where not. things actually I think start to go wrong even more is when we don't take those things totally and I talk a lot in my work about limberness and that kind of cognitive and emotional limberness to do take that balanced you know that balance, more balanced approach with things to kind of explore those those frustrating points we need to kind of lean into a different part of our brain at different points um, and yeah. be feel resourced in order to be able to to do that um so yeah that resonates a lot with me thank you uh, for picking up on that and okay so I've got some questions for you based on some of the things you said and I imagine that each of these questions could probably be like a five day podcast not a five minute <laughs> of our short podcast here so let's Are you go that I talk a lot there is that what no, you're already when I ask the question <laughs> you are going to go when I ask this question you're going to say yeah, yeah Beth, there's way more info on that than we can possibly talk about today but yeah. you said it therefore I'm going to pick up on it and one of the questions that you said you know things you were interested in was kind of really understanding what are the ingredients that help leaders and mm. this is why I'm going to ask you this question like mm. so in from your experience from your research I know you're writing mm. the book right now mm. around mm. This, this this area of leadership mm. I'm going to say what are those ingredients and yeah. I'm going to say with a caveat of we can't talk about all of them right now but what have you noticed are kind of like the top things that leaders could be thinking about here to yeah. help them in this world Totally. Yeah, no, really good question. And I like kind of slimming that down because, as you said, we could spend a long time and days talking about it. But I think there's uh, in in the research and what I'm noticing, I guess there's really there's some really juicy behaviours coming through around what leaders do that create more optimum functioning in themselves and more optimum functioning in the people in their teams and organizations and there's like some themes that are coming through I think one of the caveats of this is recognizing that you know we are all imperfect perfect human beings um so positive leaders um, and that's a term that I use to describe leaders that bring the best out of themselves and, and those around them you, you, they don't do these things 24-7 they're not always perfect they don't kind of you know live by the book on everything that they do but they have a kind of tendency for certain ways of, of behaving and I think that tendency is you know being really um abundant in the way that they think being really strengths focused in the way that they think about themselves and about others um they're not kind of rigid in the way that they um, perceive or analyse or think about things. They're very willing to kind of think broadly about things. Um, So going back to that kind of limber point and be really kind of cognitively limber um, and be really emotionally limber as well. So like willing to kind of lean into some of the emotions, accept the emotions, and also accept the emotions of of people around them and recognise that, you know, going back to your point there, Beth, that emotions are signals of information, they're data. um, And, you know, because the person in front of me is absolutely losing their mind and getting really stressed out about something, 
you know, I'm not, as a positive leader, I'm not reacting to the stress, but I'm actually holding that for a moment. And I'm being curious about what is it that's going on for this person that is making them really stressed at the moment. And, you know, generally perceiving people as always with a good intention, so that kind of unconditional positive regard, this person's coming to me because they've genuinely got a concern about something. Okay, they're not presenting that concern to me in the best way. But, you know, there's a lot going on for this person or I'm assuming there's a lot going on for this person and I'm assuming that this person has a good intention. And so I'm going to work with the information that they're bringing to me and not react to that kind of, uh, you know, more um, animalistic part of my brain where I could clearly just get really annoyed with this person in front of me. So they've got that kind of flexibility in the way that they think. They're also like full of hope. So I've done a lot of research in, into hope and hope's a really interesting one because, you know, we see like optimism and we see hope and, you know, quite often we think they're the same thing, whereas actually they're, they're really different. They're really different concepts. We measure them in different ways. They manifest in different ways. And positive leaders tend to be really hopeful in a sense that they are, um, like, you know, there's two aspects to hope. There's agency and pathways. So this idea that when we have hope, we believe um, in ourselves and what we're doing. And we also are really kind of, are structured in creating pathways to um, move forward with that hope. So we've got we've got a plan basically. We're not just optimistically thinking positively or thinking things are all going to turn out okay. Positive leaders tend to think, you know, I, I believe that in the best of myself and, and those around me to, to for this to go well. And I'm also going to plan out the pathway in which we move forward with this. And obviously, I won't be I won't be naming any names, but in terms of how people have dealt with the pandemic, you can see where there's been wild optimism. So people just thinking, oh, do you know what? It's, it's all going to be absolutely fine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's been people who've been hopeful. So there have been people who have not only believed in things kind of working out well and having the agency and faith in themselves and those around them, but actually making sure that there's a plan and a pathway forward. Um, so I guess that's the kind of third area that I'm noticing. Um, the fourth area that I'm noticing is around having a real sense of you know purpose and knowing exactly the direction that you're you're going in as a leader. Like having a real clear sense of you know who am I, what are my values, what do I stand for, what what is the purpose and what I'm doing in this meeting, in this minute, in this hour, in this day, and, you know, how do I make sure that purpose is really clear for myself, for others, for our team, and how do we keep tapping back into that, re-evaluating, checking back in on that? Um, and then like, the next area that, that feels really important is, you know, sustainability and health, um, holistic kind of attitude, holistic behaviour, so decision making and thinking, not just okay, what what's good for me in this moment and what's going to help me out, but actually, what's the bigger what's the bigger good here? So how is this decision going to affect the well being of my team? And um, how is this decision going to affect the sustainability of what we're doing as as a company and organisation? And just having a really layered and holistic approach to being healthy for ourselves, for others, for those around us. Um, and then the other thing I guess I'm, I'm wasting a lot that's coming through in the research that we're seeing a lot that gets backed up, you know, and it won't come as a surprise is, you know, having uh, like seeing that relationships and relational uh, connection with others is so critical to how we go about our work and just being really aware of these connections that we make with individuals with teams um and you know building those connections really purposefully drawing on those like seeing the way we work as being underpinned by like this very clear relational fabric and not just being about the task at hand not just being about the technical expertise in what we do but the much broader picture and how we connect with others and, and how that connection enables us to do the best thinking how that connection enables us to see what we do as really meaningful um, and I think all these behaviors they all complement and interact um, with, with one another um, in lots of different ways um, but it's yeah it, you know there, there's there's so much more came, that's come through the last kind of 20 years particularly with the growth of a positive psychology which shows us what it is that genuinely creates optimal functioning, not just kind of at an anecdotal level, but what we see through the research does. And, 
you know, I guess I see my mission and my purpose is, is spreading that that information a bit more so that we do things in a way that's a bit more savvy, that, that that's more um, purposeful for us, you know, in a way that brings more work joy um, for us. And um, yeah, so very excited to kind of sharing that more. But as you, as you know, Beth, I could talk about this for hours. I probably have done already. Um, but uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot to it. Yeah, there is. And I- I'm loving it. So I was sitting there writing some notes and there's a few things that I just wanted to kind of reflect on and, and pull out a bit more. And um, so the themes that I'm hearing through all of those different aspects are things like thinking broadly and having that kind of real breadth of understanding, whether that's around kind of the the well-being side of things whether that's around the purpose but there's that mm-hmm. actual kind of really thinking about stuff and knowing who you are knowing what you're about knowing what the purpose of the organization is about and connecting with that so mm-hmm. not getting stuck in or stuck in the weeds of stuff but kind of taking that bigger picture longer term view which I think is really interesting mm-hmm. I, I wrote down Literally. something about being psychologically yoga like Mm, love Which, that you know, idea there you go you can take that one yeah um, I will. pop it in your book Certainly, we'll um, do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I heard a lot when you were talking there about this like not being rigid being able to understand what's going on that kind of mm-hmm. uh, cognitively limber and I was thinking kind of in my brain limber always goes to something yogury and I was thinking yeah, there is something there about how do we allow our brains to do that mm. and then there were, this is another question which we we might get onto in a minute I'll come back to it but so many people in leadership positions in the way the world has worked in the traditional way have got there because they have become a very deep expert in something and then have progressed through their expertise and their kind of brilliance technically on one thing yet what we're talking about here in terms of leadership of the future and where we can get excellent leadership from is actually a broader deep deeper understanding of the bigger picture and not of one technical capability and I think that's this is not new information to people listening to this podcast but it is something there about how do we continue to challenge ourselves with leadership about it not being about being good at one thing but being able to be flexible and adaptable and understand and see and appreciate all of the cogs that make up this massive wheel Mm, yeah it's really it's really interesting I mean (sighs) And I'm just, I suppose I'm going to challenge a little bit on that, Beth, that, that people have got to where they are for technical expertise reasons. I think I think definitely to a certain extent. I also think there are other factors, um, you know, from, you know, social mobility points, people's backgrounds, people's um, wealth to a certain extent that kind of yeah. gets people into certain positions, um, you know, gender, <laughs> getting people into certain positions um, being from a certain background type, et cetera, getting people into certain positions. Um, and then, of course, there's some, some technical expertise. But, I, you know, and, and that's not always the case either because there are, I guess, accidentally lots of leaders who have that, that beautiful combination. And, and, you know, you and I have, have worked with them and, and know those, those people. Um but yeah, I think kind of going to your point about leadership of the future and that needing to be more more flexible and you know I think it, it makes me think about you know needing more diversity in our workforce you know for the first um, in the first instance um, you know gender diversity uh, ethnic diversity um, and just getting you know going back to my childhood experience of growing up um, in the east end of London surrounded by people you know, of all shapes and sizes, all sorts of backgrounds, doing all really interesting things with incredible creativity, curiosity, drive, um, and making sure that, though, you know, everybody is getting the opportunity to work in all types of organisations. So it's making me think about diversity um, first and foremost and, and needing to achieve that at all sorts of levels. You know, I think we talk a lot about it at the moment about, you know, racial diversity. But I think, you know, one of the areas that we're maybe not talking enough on is also kind of social diversity as well. Um, and again, that's another kind of tangent I could I could go off on. Um, but, yeah, you know, being able to, to, to be flexible, I, you know, I think it's recognising that we have to, like, we have to do this moving forward. I think... The pandemic has brought a lot of lessons home um, to people. I think we've seen that the the companies and the organisations that have offered a bit more flexibility to their employees have got that flexibility back in bucket loads. 
um, the leaders that are compassionate, who are mindful about their employees, who you know have conversations about these uh, the challenges that people might be facing. That is, a, you know, creating a much more return um, for those organisations than those that are being, you know, a lot more um, rigid, I guess, in the, in the way that they're approaching mm-hmm. things. Um, I think it's it's really difficult, you know, given the responsibilities that leaders have on their shoulders and everything that leaders are tasked with doing. It's it's a really hard <clears throat> thing to do, but I think we, you know, we need to be really encouraging and culturally demanding of greater self-awareness and and other awareness Um, and that needs to be something that we recruit for that we notice that we develop that we appoint people in positions of authority when they are being really um really self-reflective really self-aware um and conscious of of everything that's going on around them um so anyway my head is kind of sparking with lots of different tangent points so i'm probably not totally addressing the question beth but um don't worry it's a really good point and i think um you know i am totally on board with the idea that we need to be diverse in all shapes and sizes not just around gender or ethnicity but around how people think and how people come to the world and how people yeah. you know what social background they come from and you are Definitely. right that there are many leaders out there that come from a specific type of leader and um there might be some need to change that as the world goes forward so totally get it I am going to move on to my next point because otherwise we won't get through it um I think it's a really great one and we could definitely again do a whole nother day on the subject of how diversity will help improve leadership and um there'd be so many interesting things to talk about there maybe we'll do another one later yes let's do that let's do that um I'm loving what you're talking about there between about the difference between kind of blind optimism and hope and one of the things in in our definition of work joy is that when you feel work joy it is a hopeful place Mm -hmm. it's where you can see opportunities it's where you can Mm -hmm. have some energy to put the work in which you're talking about like that what's the pathway what's the plan it's not just going everything's going to be fine I'm happy everything's fine Mm -hmm. um it is about hope and I think I haven't heard lots of people and organizations talking about hope and I think hope is a really great thing so I'm hopeful Mm -hmm. that we can get more hope out there in the world and Mm. understand that if you can have hope you can make things happen and it's not to say that optimism is a bad thing but sometimes if it's not realistic that's not so helpful Mm. and the other things you talked about there just to to take a couple of them that around this idea of sense of purpose it's come up on so many of the podcasts Mm. we've been talking about And so many people find this subject really difficult because they're like, well, I don't really understand my purpose. And it it is about that self-awareness and maybe digging a bit deeper and connecting your own personal purpose, the purpose of the organization and being able to find some alignment there. And Mm. one thing I find is when there are people who are experiencing kind of what would I call it a chronic lack of work joy Mm -hmm. when you dig deeply it's often because their personal values and what they really believe in their purpose is directly misaligned with their organization yeah definitely definitely a key factor that comes up again and again um and yeah I mean I do I I have to admit like I do find it hugely fascinating when I am working with a group of leaders who are you know doing incredibly well um and I ask you know I ask that group of leaders you know what what are your personal values and I you know again and again I ask that question Beth and I'm astounded by the number of people that don't raise their hand or can't share them and that for me is I, I then I get naturally a little bit worried because I know that if we don't understand our own personal values that's going to cause all sorts of interesting um, overwhelm, being pulled to pull to pull, being pulled for pillar to post when challenges come our way, and when you know the VUCA world that we live in, um, knowing our values personally really is a massive anchor for us psychologically. Um, and yeah, it's just a really you know chronic lack of you know of of understanding that, which therefore then ends up leading to a lack of of work joy. And I, I think 
not knowing kind of one's own strengths, one's own values, um, and how the values align to the organisation, how my values align to the work that I do is a real missed opportunity for people. And I, you know, if, if there's one thing I'd like to achieve in, in my lifetime is getting more people to understand their own personal values. And I think the leaders that the leaders that demonstrate the positive leadership behaviours are really aware um, of those values and have kind of sought them out, um, not always necessarily crystal clearly. But they're kind of more aware of those and they're more able to align the work that they do in the organisation, the way their team works and, and how that all um, fits together well. And I think the other thing is it, with um, that sense of purpose is kind of coupled with our values is being aware of, of our strengths and what we're really good at and recognising, you know, going back to the point of you know, diversity and diversity in the way we think, you know, diversity in the strengths that we have, like we all have different unique strengths, which are the things that, that engage us when we work, the things that give us a lot of energy in the way that we work. And I think if people understand more about what their own strengths are as a human being, and there's, you know, lots of different ways that we can, we can do that and assess that now, we can use that to kind of, again, align not just our, our purpose to the work that we do, but also the type of work that we do. So understanding more about ourselves and the team that we work in, we can distribute more of, of, of the workload so that people are doing the things that they really get passion in, that, that energised by, that, that drive them, which, again, can heighten this, this sense of purpose. So I think, you know, it's a lot about values alignment and it's a lot about working to your your strengths and yeah totally agree with you there Beth and and I think these are things that you know if considered by organizations can make such an incredible difference and I just see it day in day out which is which is really lovely um and you know working with an organization recently across the senior leadership team and the middle leadership team and introducing this understanding has been incredibly um, valuable to that organization that managed to kind of weather some really critical moments um, over the last year. So it just makes such a difference. Um, and I feel like I want to go on to another tangent of another topic, but I, I should go back to you, uh, Beth, and see what your reflections are. <laughs> I, I mean, as you know, like I, I'm a massive um, proponent and advocate of values and the importance of them for organisations and individuals and leaders and everybody. Mm, yeah. One thing I'm, I was just really reflecting on there while you were talking about it is I think sometimes when you talk about values in organisations, sometimes they're seen as kind of like slightly a cheesy thing to be talking about or slightly mm -hmm. too fluffy. Yeah. And I love the way you describe them there as like the real anchor for your leadership and they're a real anchor psychologically to help you do things well. Mm. Is I'd love us to to help people understand that mm. values aren't cheesy and that they're no. not fluffy and that they actually yeah. have real strength behind them and can really mm. help you do stuff Definitely. and you know some of the organizations I work with on developing values and understanding what they're all about and helping you kind of describe them ca it can help an organization achieve amazing things it can help leaders really understand and be the best that they can be yeah. you know as often as they can be that understanding that everyone is imperfect in these things totally. and also the other thing I was really reflecting on is the fact that we need to also people who are kind of values led we need to check in on our own values because mm -hmm. i think mm -hmm. I and um, as you change and grow as a person and as mm -hmm. you develop new strengths and new skills and as you understand the world in different ways mm -hmm. sometimes those values change but we haven't checked in on them mm -hmm. yeah yeah i mean it's it's re it's really interesting because <laughs> I mean, the, the, the science would say, contrarily, that our values don't really change significantly um, over time. So once we get to a certain point in our adulthood, they're not going to change too much. However, I think what you're saying is, is really important is that kind of checking back in, because maybe the order of them has changed based on the given circumstance that you're at right now. Maybe that, that, that some have come more to the fore based on the situation that you're in now. Maybe something is more important to you now in a particular value. You know, for example, when people go through major transitions, um, growing their family, um, changing in career, changing role, that kind of thing, there's definitely that that change. And, and yes, completely agree with you, Beth, that we need to do that constant check-in and realignment um, is so important. And, you know, going back to kind of the difference it makes for people's leadership, I also think it, you know, has the potential to save people's mental health, like entirely, if people understand their values and, and live to their values. It's much easier for us to undergo some of the stresses and, and challenges that we go through. Um, 
and yeah there is just just real strength behind them and, and back to your point about values being seen as cheesy and fluffy I think where that kind of comes about is often often this kind of lack of integrity between what maybe an organization or a team or a leader says are their values versus the way they behave in accordance with those values so Mm -hmm. your point about checking back in on them like are we living them are we breathing them are we using them all the time and using them to help shape our systems and our processes and what we do and how we behave it's going to be so important for them not to be kind of empty words um, and, you know, having kind of words up on a, on a wall when you walk around an, an office, you know, doesn't tell me if those values exist. What tells me is when I'm having conversations, when I'm interviewing um, individuals in, in, a, in a firm, an organisation, and I can actually see those values coming to life. And so I think, you know, we're, we're, we're you know, bright people, we're bright human beings. Human beings are sassy, they're snazzy, they can work stuff out instinctively. And so an employee will instinctively and a leader will instinctively know when a value is just not there's not integrity behind it. We sniff it out. We're animals at the end of the day. And so I think that's where the kind of cheesy fluffy chain has come from is where it's been done badly and and where they're not where there isn't a real understanding behind you know, the depth of, as, you know, as you've described there, Beth, the depth of what values can bring us and just having, I guess, even a little bit of um, seriousness about what values really are. Um, and I think, you know, I, I'm sure we know that, that and have experienced and been through development in, in different organisations and have seen where values are, are, are taught not not very well they're taught badly they're instigated in a, in a bad way that can really switch us off and demotivate us um so we, it has to be done in the right way it has to be treated with real um you know integrity it has to be treated with a, a, a weightiness around it um and also I think there's something about you know going to work in an organization being told that these are your values and these are the values of the organization like you know you have to And I know that lots of organisations have brilliant recruitment processes where they look at this, but you have to really buy into those values. You have to understand those values um, and just impart the induction, understand where they're coming from. And I think, again, understand your own personal values and how do your personal values link to the values of this organisation and do they not link? And and what does that say? And what does that mean about how much purpose you're going to get in this environment? Um, So again, something that we could spend days talking about, but it's so, it's so important. Yeah. And uh, what I am going to do now, because uh, to make sure that people don't switch off because we've been talking for four hours. So I'm going to move (laughs) us on to our quick fire question. So we could totally talk about values. We could talk about leadership. We could talk about it for days and days and days. And thank you for sharing your insight so far. And it would be lovely to talk about some of these things more in the future. Right. Here is the quick fire questions. Are you ready? Sure. Fire away. So this is a personal one. So for you personally, Mm -hmm. what thing is always guaranteed to bring you a little bit of work joy. Yeah. So I think it's doing anything at all that is working to my strengths and values. So anything that's related to leadership, compassion, empathy, when I'm coaching, when I'm listening to what people are saying, what they're bringing, any opportunities to be enthusiastic or build relationships. So, you know, going back to the point that we've made already, just anything values related for me or strengths related brings me so much work joy and life joy. Great. Thank you so much. Second question. Yes. What book are you currently reading? Yeah, so um, I'm currently rereading, because it's just a great read, a collection of essays called How to Be a Positive Leader. And it's edited by two um, absolutely phenomenal American women who are like gurus of positive organisations called Jane Dutton and Gretchen Schweitzer. Um, two amazing women who've been really campaigning um, for a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about today in the very long careers um so it's a great read really good oh, selection of fantastic. short essays yeah yeah, we, yeah fantastic. we can talk about that um, again yeah what's the best or most useful bit of advice that somebody has given you in your life in your career mm-hmm. that you always find yourself coming back to or passing on yeah really so I, I know that you knew you were going to ask me this one Beth I kept on coming back to something that my grandmother um, has always said, actually, which is your education is the one thing that can never be taken away from you. Um, And I I find this really interesting. Like 
basically it's really instilled that kind of constant learning mentality because everything we learn everything we we kind of take on board we carry with us um through life um and there's a whole kind of backstory to to why she used to talk about that you know from living in a country that was under kind of occupation and um how that how that experience was for her like having her home taken away from her and all those different things but knowing that the things that she learned were in her head and no one could ever take them away from her really gave her a strong sense of of meaning so um I think that's something I carry with me and may I cheekily have a second one yeah of course you can so my second one was and then this is it feels like a bit of a cliche but I think it's a cliche we must acknowledge which is always put your own oxygen mask on first um and I work with a lot of leaders trying to do everything and anything for everyone around them doing an amazing job but not necessarily looking after themselves first and it's just so important for the sustainability of those incredibly gifted leaders to do that so definitely always put your own oxygen mask on first it might be a cliche it might be a bit cheesy but it's Mm. an important one but I don't mind I'll allow it for thank you thank you (laughs) so thinking about advice what is one super practical bit of advice that you could give our listeners that they could go and do today tomorrow the next day every day something yeah maybe that would help them to build some work joy in their life yeah so I think it's going back to what we discussed without sounding like a broken record just go and assess your own values work out what they are hold them close put them in your chest put them on your wall and work those out there's lots of really great ways that you can do that um and just work out your own strengths as well what are your strengths um, what are do they look like how can I assess what they are and you know hold those two incredibly important parts of who you are your values and your strengths really close to you and I think they will resource you no end and help you out in so many different ways and certainly something that's really helped me over the years Fab thank you so much and my final question for you is where can our audience find out more about you and your work Great. Yeah. So um, I'm on LinkedIn. So Beth and I are both on LinkedIn. So you can find me under Cornelia Lucy or um, my newly launched uh, website, which is www.corneliaLucy.com. Um, and I'd love to kind of, if, if people want to pick up or carry on this conversation, I'd love to hear more. Brilliant. And um, just so that people know, the book you're writing, when might we see it on our shelves? Yes. So good question. It's going to be a long time coming, so it won't be out until next year. So um, maybe we can pick back up and talk about this again um, next year. Fantastic. So one to look out for in the coming year. Thank you so much, for Cornelia, for being with us today we could have talked for hours on end maybe we'll do another one on another subject at another point in time but thank you so much for your time thank you Beth have a great day and uh, enjoy bringing lots of work joy to everyone that you're continuing to work with oh I shall thank you for listening to my conversation with Cornelia there's a lot of great stuff in there from her research from her practical work with leaders And there are a few things that I really pulled out. In fact, there are three for me that I'm really considering taking away and considering in more detail. And the first one is this idea of optimism and hope and that sense of the future can and will be better. But not just blindly thinking that without taking any action. It's about people who can think like that and find the way towards it, find the way to action to lead people with that. And I really like the word hope. I think hopefulness is a wonderful thing. I think it helps us to keep things in perspective. I think as a leader, it really helps other people to be able to get through difficult times, challenging situations. And I love the idea of thinking that of hopefulness and optimism as a real leadership trait. I also love the second one that really came stand up for me is this again we've heard it on many of the podcasts this sense of purpose that people have understanding where you're heading why we're doing it not just what we're doing being driven by that bigger thing whatever that bigger thing is and I think in some places that's harder to do than others but it's not impossible and if you've never thought about that either as an individual or as a team or as an organization it's definitely something worth having a discussion some thinking time some discovery 
on that area. And the third one, and you'd have heard lots of people on this podcast if you listen to many episodes talk about values. And it's so important, isn't it, to really get them to understand them for yourself, to align them with what's going on in your organisation, to check in on them, to see if those priorities have changed for you because different things are happening for you in your life. And it's so important, isn't it, to just really understand yourself in that way. So those three things, optimism, sense of purpose and values. And if you are leading or want to be a leader, maybe it's something to go and discover and think a bit more about in those areas, how you can show them, how you can demonstrate them, how you can lead them in your organisation. So a huge thank you to Cornelia for joining me on this podcast. If you want to find more about Cornelia, we'll put all the details in the show notes so you can link through to her and if you want to find more about Create Work Joy, do come and follow us on our social platforms. We are on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at Create Work Joy. We also have our website, www.createworkjoy.com. I was doing the social ones there. And on there, you can find out more about the Work Joy Way, which is my 16 week signature coaching program helping you to create and cultivate more joy in your working life and also about our growing community the club work joy of people who are trying to do that and working together and being inspired to make that happen thank you very much for listening today i do hope you enjoyed it maybe go and have a listen to another episode thank you